Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Amelia Holmes, and I'm excited to introduce you to our speaker. Tonight with us is Carl Wetzel. He's the Nantucket Historical Association's Collection Specialist and the Manager of K-12 Education. Carl holds a Master of Arts in Museum Studies from the Cooperstown Graduate Program and a Bachelor of Arts in History from Hartwick College. Before joining the NHA team, Carl has held education and collections management positions at the Hanford Mills Museum, the Yeager Museum of Arts and Culture, and the Fenimore Art Museum. In his current role, Carl divides his time between cataloging the NHA's archaeological collections, creating family and student programming, and the interpretation and operation of the old mill. I'm going to turn it over to Carl now. It's so wonderful to have you all joining us tonight on this cold February Nantucket evening. Before I get started, I just wanted to give a shout out to the whole team here who's been doing a great job of putting these webinars together and um, let everyone know that the NHA is open tomorrow, uh, so reserve your spots. So as Amelia mentioned, I've been working at Historic Mills for five or six years, and it's such a privilege and an honor to be able to present um, some history about the old mill here in Nantucket. And one of the things that um, working at all these historic mills has shown me is that mills are really a representation of the communities that they are in. And I think our mill is a great example of that. Um, it shows us the agrarian past. It takes us through the rise and fall of the whaling industry and then shows us the 20th century reemergence of Nantucket as a great spot for families to come and visit every summer. So with that, I think we'll get started. So we're going to start with uh, just a little bit of geography. Um, for those of you who aren't here on Nantucket with us, the Old Mill is on the south side of the town of Nantucket. And we're looking at the William Macy 1834 map here showing three um, hexagons, um, which are probably represent representing uh, the three, three of the four mills that were up here on uh, Mill Hill. Um, copper, it's between Pleasant and Copper, uh, Pleasant and Prospect Street today. Um, Prospect Street used to be called Copper Street, and you can see that sort of running into a dead end over um, about a block away from where the, where the mill is currently situated. So the old mill is thought to be the oldest continuously operating windmill in America. Uh, but this moniker can be misleading. It was not the first windmill built in America, but it has remained in relatively consistent operation um, since the time of its construction. Um, even though the old mill is one of the most iconic landmarks on the island, its early history was not well documented. And this can partially be explained by the ubiquitous of mills themselves in the period. Um, they were everywhere. Every community had one and used one, and it was a good um, uh, it was it was just in line with all of the industry that was happening happening in that area during the period. Here in Nantucket, there was at least seven mills by the 18th century. Five produced cornmeal. The other two were fulling mills, um, sites where locally produced wool was pounded um, to to tighten the fibers. Our ideas of wind and water mills today are rather quaint. For people of the period, they were the functional equivalent of any factory. Water mills were especially dirty. They clogged up river passages with their debris. And windmills were a cleaner option, but less efficient. Um, they were less reliable. As you imagine, a, a river channel would be more consistent, able to run um, longer through the year, while as a windmill needed to have a high point or next to um, uh, the ocean where there was a, a strong amount of wind coming um, year round. So the Old Mill is a smock style mill, um, a, du a Dutch and English type of mill because it tapers like a smock. Um, today, uh, as in the past, the Old Mill is used to uh, ground dried corn into meal, but it is not an FDA approved food processing facility. So uh, we sell our cornmeal as a food product. So on this slide, we see a little bit of the history of windmills themselves. Um, they're all basically doing the same thing. They're converting fluid energy, the uh, wind power, water power, tide power um, into mechanical energy. So basically they're using nature to make a job a little bit easier. The earliest identified mills were constructed by the ancient Greeks, and I'm talking about water mills. 
uh, with some of the early, earliest examples found in Turkey. The earliest windmills were probably built in the Middle East. Uh, you can see an image of one of those Middle Eastern windmills on the top left. This technology moved east to China, um, and they were much different from the vertical style windmills that we're familiar with in Europe and America. Um, those sweeps spun horizontally like this. Researchers suspected the development of the Western style windmill occurred independently from, the Eastern, from their Eastern counterparts sometime in the 10th, 11th, or 12th centuries. The earliest European mills were called post mills. Post mills are of Northern European origin. The entirety of a post mill, and you can see a post mill on the bottom center here, rotates to face the wind. So the entire structure is turning when they want to face wherever the, whatever direction the wind's coming from. Um, so tower mills, uh, which you can see on the top, top right, are commonly found in the southern parts of Europe, and these developed from the post mill. Um, these tower mills didn't change direction, suggesting a consistent um, direction where the wind was coming from. By the 16th and 17th centuries, the smock style mill, like we're familiar with here at the here in Nantucket became the most popular type of windmill in, uh, in Europe. They were relatively cheap compared to the tower mills, but because they rotated with a cap instead of the whole structure, and we'll get into that a little bit later, um, they were much more sturdy than the post mills, and so you could fit more machinery inside of it. Um, today, we also, and, and I should mention as well that, that today people are still using fluid energy and turning it into mechanical energy, but Nantucket High School is a great example. Um, but a wind turbine, it's using the same principle, but it's turning um, that energy into electrical power rather than a mechanical job. Um, but it's still this, essentially the same idea. So this is one of my favorite images of the old mill. It was done in 1908 by James Wendell Folger. And what I love about it is that I notice something new every time. This obviously wasn't contemporaneous to when these, these four mills were up on Mill Hill. This was done quite a bit later. Um, but there's always something really interesting. For one, the, art, the artist is taking some liberties. There's a ship in the background, and you wouldn't have been able to see a ship from this angle. The ocean is the other way. Um, and you can also see a capstan. So like on a ship, you can do a mechanical job. You can turn something with a capstan. And on the old mill, which is on the left here, you can see that the tail pole, the big piece of wood with the wheel attached to it, is attached to a capstan. So that meant that they were turning the top with a mechanical advantage rather than like a horse or an oxen, which is usually how it's interpreted anyway, getting off on a tangent. So if we're standing on Mill Hill, it's not hard to imagine us taking a little step back in time. Um, the town is receding into the distance. You might have some sheep like you see in this picture. And you have three other mills on the hillside as well. Uh, the Wampanoags called this hill Popsquatchet, which translates to the windy place. And that's a good um, description. It's one of the highest points on the island, and it has really commanding views um, all around. Um, the old mill was originally known as the Swain or East Mill, being the easternmost of the four windmills on the hill. And it was operated for most of its history by the Swain family. It's the first half of its history. There are three other mills. There were three other mills on, the, on Pop Squatch at the Barnabas Bunker Mill. Um, which is the next one on this picture, the West or Red Mill. And then the last one down on the bottom right there is called the Spider Mill, and it had uh, eight sweeps rather than, rather than four. And these were all taken down for various reasons. The, the Bunker Mill was blown up um, by dynamite, the Spider Mill was dismantled for parts, and the West Mill was um, reportedly struck down by lightning. So while much of the Nantucket Wampanoag diet consisted of shellfish and game, they also practiced the farming gardening technique of planting corns, beans, and squash together. Sometimes this is called the Three Sisters, which is a Haudenosaunee name. To grind their grain, the Wampanoags used uh, wooden or stone mortars and pestles. When the Europeans started arriving in the 17th century, um, many of whom held, uh, hailed from the English lowlands, wheat was the preferred grain product and not corn. But unfortunately, Nantucket had neither the ideal climate or soil conditions for wheat farming, so corn became the most prominent crop on the island. 
and it was turned into a variety of things. Johnny cake, um, cornmeal, obviously. Um, uh, whalers would use it on ships uh, as hardtack. So it really became a really important food staple for the island. Um, so fall is harvest season, and after four to eight weeks, farmers would bring their now dried corn to the windmill to be ground. Um, so it was sort of a custom job. The Millers, the, the Massachusetts um, uh, statute was one sixteenth of all corn ground at a Miller's mill was his payment. So it, it was, um, they were being paid in the cornmeal that they were grinding. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history. Um, it's thought that the old mill was constructed by uh, a mariner named Nathan Wilbur, um, but like much of the early history of the windmills, uh, this is more legend than historical fact and record. Um, we do know that for much of its history, it was owned by the Swain family. So from 1746 to 1820, it was passed from father to son, from Alicium to Timothy, Charles, and Nathan Swain. Um, when Nathan sold the mill to Jared Gardner in 1828, it was in very poor condition. Uh, they thought, uh, the Swains thought they were selling it to Gardner for parts, but Gardner decided, um, who was a wheelwright, decided to repair it and, and to sell it. He was not successful until 1855. Um, after 1855, it was owned by a series of Azorian um, former sailors and relatives, uh, George Enos, John Murray, and John Francis Sylvia. And because this time frame corresponds with the decline of the whaling industry, uh, their ownership suggests that um, there were increased economic opportunities for the island's immigrant community during this period. In 1898, uh, the mills operated uh, for the last time as a commercial entity, um, but by then it was already a tourist attraction. So people were already coming up to the mill and taking photos next to this curious island landmark. And I just want to take a second to look at these great images. The two on the left side are both of John um, Francis Sylvia, so the, the last owner of the mill as a, as a business. Uh, the image on the right is by Eastman Johnson, 1873. And we think that's one of the only images of the interior of the round top mill. So it was a mill that wasn't one of the four on, um, on the four on the hill here, but it was a Nantucket windmill. And it's just a really, really great picture, a falling market. Um, it was the last year that the round top mill was in operation. So it's always nice to contextualize why some, a business declines like this. And there were several factors um, for the decline of windmilling on Nantucket and, and across America. So one of the first is uh, steam power. So this is a photograph of the interior of the Island Service Company plant around 1910. And steam power and later gasoline provided a, a reliable, um, vastly more powerful energy source for, for business. Um, old mills, if they, were con if they weren't just torn down or forgotten about, uh, were converted. So we have wooden gears inside of the old mill. Um, most mills uh, that were still being used were converted uh, into metal pulleys with leather belts um, for their drive. And in fact, a lot of the buffalo um, hunted out west were hunted for their, um, for their hides, for, for, for belts in, in mills in the 19th century. Um, additional factors include the island's poor soil conditions in general. So it wasn't a great place to grow corn anyway. There was um, reliable shipping from the mainland. And overall, there was a deinvestment in the economy here. So it's, um, it's, predictable that these windmills stop being um, useful as a, as a business venture. So we get to 1897, when the recently formed uh, Nantucket Historical Association placed a winning bid for the old mill for $885, uh, thanks in part to a generous donation by Miss Carolyn French. It was open for us as a tourist attraction the following season, and it has been uh, ran, operated, and interpreted by the NHA for over 120 years. Um, this is a great photo of Main Street during the Old Mill auction on August 5th of 1897, and there's a little plaque on the bottom right um, showing that we secured the mill and that Miss Carolyn French had a big part in that. 
So this next um, group of slides, and I'm happy to talk more about history if people have questions later on, but this next group of slides is really about how the mill operates, because one of the most incredible things about this structure is that it's basically a working artifact. And so for everyone who's had a chance to visit or had a chance to work inside the mill, um, it's just a really, it's a, it's a great pleasure to see this old structure in operation as it was um, over 200 years ago. So here's a nice uh, architectural drawing of the mill. It's an eight-sided structure. It has uh, three stories. It is a timber framed building with wooden pegs instead of nails when there was a need for pegs. And most of those uh, beams are made of oak. It has gray shingles with red trim in the classic Nantucket style. And while the exterior of the structure, which is exposed to the elements has been replaced repeatedly over the years, we think um, most of the internal structural components are original to the 18th century. Um, one of the legends is about where the wood came from for the mill for whatever reason. Um, there is speculation that wood came from shipwrecks off the coast of Nantucket. Um, others suspect that it came from a, uh, the Dead Horse Valley right across from the old mill. Um, but the most likely explanation is that the timbers were simply shipped over from the mainland at some point. Um, let's go to the next slide, thank you. So as we think about the early history of the, wind, the, the old mill and the other mills here in Nantucket, the visual sources ask very interesting questions about our interpretation of the site. So this is a 1782 map of Nantucket, um, and you can see four windmills next to the town of Sherburn, which is the town of Nantucket today. I have uh, Brant Point circled as a reference. And the thing I wanted to point out, as we had just, we just learned a little bit about post mills and smock mills and their difference, is that those mills are not smock mills. Those are post mills. They have a narrow bottom. And if we go to the next slide, we see additional evidence of this. So this is an 1811 um, image by Benjamin Tanner. And those four mills up on the hill are again depicted as post mills with the very narrow bottom. Um, if we go to the next slide, we see that by 1881, uh, the, the smock shape is, is clear, it's evident. Um, so what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that our interpretation might be incorrect about the, the age of the mill. Whether or not they were um, converted at some point is an open question. Whether or not the artists were taking liberties with their, their imagery is, is another potential explanation. Uh, but without definitive documentary evidence, we're not going to be able to answer these questions. So every interpreter at the NHA, every visitor has their favorite site. For those of us who love the old mill, as I mentioned earlier, one of the coolest things about it is this, it's this working artifact, this working place. And so I just wanted to show a couple of comparative photos. Uh, those uh, paintings on the left are 19th century and it might be early 20th century. And you can see how clearly, how clearly similar those two spaces are then and today. Um, the old miller on the top left is using the lever, um, which adjusts the distance between the stones. And you can see a lever just like that on the right side, a little bit thicker, but the same design, same principle. And then the bottom image shows how similar the, the casing is around the top stone, um, the top stone of the two stones we use to grind corn. It's almost a perfect copy. And again, this just makes it such a thrilling experience to to be in that space when it's operating. So now a little bit about the parts of the mill. I hope people are enjoying the, the discussion of the, 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 the workings. So um, in the summer months, the NHA operates our windmill. The first step um, is to put the sweeps on. So if you're up at the mill hill um, in the off season, you'll see the red sweep sitting just right next to the mill. So those are those need to be put up in the springtime. This re requires a little bit of cleverness and some elbow grease. Um, on windy but not too windy days, clear days, the large sails are put up. Um, the sails are used to increase the surface area that is catching the wind, as you might imagine. Um, so when you have lots of sails, you have lots of surface area, and when you have fewer sails, you have less surface area. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this image also shows us the cap or the bonnet, 
which um, is how a, a, a smock mill like this rotates. So the cap is not attached to the structure at all. It sits just, sit, it's resting right on top like a bottle cap. And to turn the cap, you use the tail pole, as I mentioned on that previous slide. So the tail pole sitting there um, attached to a horse, an oxen, a capstan, or a, a truck today is how we rotate the mill. Um, in the summer, you usually see the mill facing Prospect Street. Um, and it kind of rotates at 30 or 40 degrees. But historically, with winds coming from the north in the fall during harvest season, I suspect the mill was is more commonly facing the opposite direction. Um, and as we get ourselves into the interior, we also should point out the wind shaft, which is how the power from the wind is being um, transported inside the structure into mechanical energy. So this is a this is just a video which demonstrates that surface area question. So this is the mill running with two with two sheets on, reefed back, so they're tied back. And you can see, I think, the, the clouds, maybe it's, it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see how fast the clouds are moving on the top. So um, this was a very windy day. And so when we have lots of wind, but it's still within safe parameters, we just put on a couple sheets and see how things go. And, um, and depending on how fast or how slow the wind's going, we can add and subtract sheets. So it's it's always about keeping a consistent um, speed, a consistent rate of motion, rather than having the windmill go too fast. Um, that's not really the purpose. The purpose is for it to just continually go at a nice, easy pace. Um, so as we move into the structure itself, um, the third floor has most of the essential gearing components. So in this image, we see the crown gear, which is this huge set of wooden teeth. Um, that's attached directly to the wind shaft. So when the sweeps outside spin, the crown gear spins along with it. When the crown gear meets the grinding shaft um, via this um, gear system we call the bird cage or wallower, um, it speeds up the grind shaft, how fast it rotates. And that has to do with the ratio of gears. So when there are fewer gears on, this is kind of like uh, little kid science, but when there's fewer gears on, on one set as the other, that, that um, post will spin more quickly. There's also an uneven ratio. And so that means that when a, a certain teeth hits a certain spot, it, it doesn't hit that spot repeatedly. So um, there is an additional wear in certain spots. It, it has an uneven number. So with all these interlocking gears, wood on wood, uh, mechanical systems, problems do occur. And so this video um, is taken by a miller trying to figure out where the problem is arising. So you can see it start to speed up and notice how it kind of skips in a second here, it kind of bounces. So that bounce isn't good. And one of the things actually one of our millers, uh, Joe and Manny worked on, two of our millers last year was to, to fix that particular issue. So there's always something like this happening up on the third floor where there are all these historic working parts. Little adjustments are constantly being made to, to uh, address these problems. We have a, the most experienced miller on staff, Tom Miner, is actually the person who makes those wooden teeth on the crown gear and the pinions actually too, the, the teeth that are meeting it. Um, so those are, those are hand, hand carved wooden teeth. So let's finally get to grinding. So it's a grist mill. And what we're doing is using all this wind power to turn two stones against each other. Um, when corn is fed between the two stones, um, you'll grind dried corn into flour. And the fineness of the grind um, depends on how close those two stones are from one another. Excuse me. Today, the mill has two um, staff people running the mill at any given time, then usually we have a third person interpreting the site for visitors. Um, this, the miller on the second floor is responsible for feeding the corn into the stones. And the miller on the first floor is responsible for deciding how close those two stones are together. Um, the miller on the second floor is a very important job because when you wanna stop the mill, you wanna grind to a halt. 
and you grind to a halt by feeding extra corn between the two stones. Um, you never want to rub the two stones together because um, mills have a tendency to explode with all that corn flour floating through the air. So it's very important that you're not causing a spark in your millstones. And I just wanted to show another nice image. Um, that's the, the top stone without its wooden casing. That casing is, is used to keep all that nice flour, which you can see there on the bottom from escaping. And it, it kind of sends it over to a chute and down to the first floor. Um, so this is just a great picture with Tom Miner there in the, in the top left um, of the millstones um, as they're getting cleaned out. Um, So as we head to the first floor, we have this really incredible um, uh, system of simple machines. So we have um, a lever here. Um, the lever is attached to um, a series of pulleys. And this gives the miller on the first floor the ability to lift a 2,500 pound millstone up and down ever so slightly, um, but still is, they are able to lift um, that stone up and down. And this does a couple of things. So when you want to get the mill started, you have the stones as far apart as they can get. And when there's no friction, um, the mill is able to start to spin. As you start to get a good amount of momentum, um, the miller will bring the stones closer together um, to, to, um, to provide um, the grinding surface. And like I said, if you raise the stones up a little bit more, you'll, you'll make grit. So you won't make the really fine cornmeal. You'll make kind of a, a more rustic product, which you probably feed to the chickens. And like I said, um, this is all a lever system, a pulley system. So um, it's really great for, for us to, to go in there with kids and, and um, visitors of all ages and talk about how simple machines let somebody do a really tough job a little bit easier. So I hope this isn't self-serving, but this is a video of me um, operating the mill a couple summers ago. And I just wanted to demonstrate um, you know, how this works. So I'm, I'm, right now the stones are about as far apart as they can be. And then when I feel it slowing down, I'm easing it, easing the, the stones closer together so we can start to grind. And so it's kind of just all day back and forth. Um, we, we sometimes talk about the mill um, as a, like a sailor would talk about sailing. So you're looking out into the horizon um, seeing uh, maybe a tree move in the distance and making adjustments accordingly. And this is a way we can kind of anticipate if the mill's speeding up or slowing down. So I just wanted to, to finish, finish off here by talking a little bit about the, the service that millers have, um, have put into this site since it became a, a a uh, place of historic interpretation. So people like John Stackpole, John Gilbert, Tom Miner, um, and more recently Manny Sylvia and, and Joe Bedell. These are people who are really important for our community here and they did incredible work. Um, you can see I think John Stackpole there in the, the center of image. Um, there's been a couple of major restoration um, jobs done at the mill over the years, 1930s. This photo on the right is from the 1980s. So it's, it's in need of constant attention and repair. It's obviously in this very um, vulnerable space, um, but you know, it's all worth it because when we have families coming by, um, experiencing the mill for the first time or the, the first time this season, or if they, they come you know, once a week, it's just really wonderful to be able to share in this um, historic spot with all the, the wonderful visitors we get to meet and, and talk to up there. And this is a nice image, I think, of some some visitors having a dramatic pose at the, the front door of the mill. So I hope that um, covers everything you're interested in, but I'm happy to answer any questions and I think we'll, we'll stop the, the, the show. Hey, Carl. Um, that was incredible. And I always, uh, I, I'm just always amazed at how much more there is to know. And I feel like, especially with the mill, um, it's to me like just such a dramatic sight, but it's, I, there's so much more that goes on behind the scenes. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to walk us through that tonight. Um, so we do have questions open and we have had a few come in. Um, and so one person here has said, I've never heard the veins referred to as sweeps. So do you know when and where that term um, 
has arose from? Um, it's a good question. We kind of go back and forth. So I, I call them sweeps. Some people call them veins. Um, so it's just, it's just one of those things. It's, it, 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 it's, not, it's not dead set on sweeps, um, but some people do refer to, refer to them that way. Cool, thanks. So can you, uh, this one's fun. So can you please discuss the meaning of the phrase nose to the grindstone in the context of a miller's operation of the stones? Do you, do you know what that relationship is? Sure. So these are, I love these. I didn't, I also didn't mention three sheets to the wind. So I'm happy to talk about that too. But yes, no, nose to the grindstone refers to hard work today. Um, for a miller, keeping your nose to the grindstone is what I was just talking about a few minutes ago. So if you smell like the smell of a burnt popcorn inside your mill, then you're causing a spark and things might go poorly. So the idea of nose to the grindstone is um, making sure you're paying attention to what's going on around you. Otherwise you might blow up your windmill. Um, I love that. <laughs> That's great, thanks. Um, let's see, so we also have, um, how many millers would work one time in the 1800s? I think you've talked about that a little bit, but maybe you could tell us some more. Yeah, so the, the 1908 painting shows, I think two millers working at that site, but um, I, we've, we've certainly had interpreters 30, 40 years ago who ran the mill by themselves. So it's certainly possible to run the mill by yourself. It would have been quite difficult with a thousand um, pounds of cornmeal coming through to get all that stuff bagged and run at the same time. Um, so it was probably a combination of a few, you know, maybe one, two or three staff people, depending on the time of year, depending how, how busy the operation was. Um, but it's certainly possible to run it with one, um, but much more difficult. So um, running it with one person, if something goes wrong, um, it's very hard to, um, to keep, to get everything back under control. I feel like that's true about much in life, Carl. Um, <laughs> can you tell us, does the wind turn the top or the bottom stone? Like what's, which one's turning? Are they both turning? That's a good question. Yeah, so the bottom stone doesn't move. So it's just the top stone that spins. Um, and the nether stone, the bottom stone stays stationary. Okay, great. So can you also tell us once again, what, um, what was the Wampanoag name for this site? Uh, Pop Squatch It. Pop Squatch It. Um, have there, I feel like this is a no, but I'm going to ask because you would know better, but have there been any explosions from the corn dust here that we know of? Um, as far what? as I know, there, I mean, certainly not at the old mill, um, but, uh, you know, the, so Bunker Mill apparently was blown up in a dynamite experiment. What I've read is that it was blown up because they were testing um, fire prevention methods. Um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that particular story. Um, so as far as I know, none of the mills blew up because of, of a flower explosion, but um, I could be wrong. Yeah, definitely uh, an area for, uh, for us to look into for sure. Um, cool. So did the Millers live nearby um, in order to like, were, did they live nearby and was it to like be able to better care for the mill? I don't have a good sense of where they lived. Um, it's, I mean, when you look at windmills in Holland, people have beds inside the mill. So, I, you know, I think it's entirely possible that somebody was spending, um, at least some nights at the mill. The days were much longer um, as a seasonal operation when you have so much corn. Um, I suspect that people were working very long hours at the old mill and the other mills here in, the, here in Nantucket. And um, I, see, I think it's entirely possible that people were, were at least spending the night if not living at the mill permanently. Yeah, and you did mention that it was a shorter season. So it's not like that's a year round you know, situation, right? Yeah, there may have been milling going around, going all year round, but it was there was certainly a peak season. Um, still true today. So, do you know anything about the fulling mills on Fulling Mill Road? So, I've done I've done a little bit of research on the fulling mills recently. There isn't a ton of information. There's a there's a really great um, print, um, mid century print of the of the fulling mill um, by Pulpus Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows it as being, I think, a tide mill and windmill combination. Um, but no, I don't have a good, other than just a couple of visual sources, I, I don't have a great sense of how those businesses operated, what time of years they were operating, other than, you know, obviously sheep shearing season. So um, it's a good question and another uh, area for further investigation. 
Yeah, and can you talk about, um, does the phrase three sheets to the wind, does that have any relevance here? Is that related to, to the mills at all? Yeah, so sailors and millers um, <laughs> have a debate about three sheets to the wind. It's um, obviously used in both contexts. For, for millers, um, the idea is that you only want two or four sails on your windmill, because if you had three, it'll start to get tipsy, start to lean over a little bit too much. Um, as we all know, sometimes you, uh, people do get three sheets of the wind too. So yeah, the idea is that you want to keep either two or four sails on so your, your mill doesn't get out of balance. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we've had someone ask if you could talk about the experience when the mill is running. Like, what is that like uh, for, for the person there? It's a great question. It's my, one of my favorite experiences um, working at the NHA for sure. Um, so as an, for, if you're operating it, especially if there's lots of wind, it can be rather stressful, um, especially if you, um, well, it's mostly nice, but sometimes stressful. If things are going a little bit too fast and you feel like you need to slow the thing down or you might start to break something, it can be stressful, but overall it's just a really thrilling experience. Um, and again, it's just so nice to work with those, um, with the staff people up there and to show people how it works because the coolest thing about the site is that it's this working place and all of a sudden somebody who doesn't have any interest whatsoever in machinery or didn't, um, is like, oh wow, like this is a, this is history that's moving right now in front of me. So yeah. Well, and I feel like it probably also helps that you have uh, such passionate people at the mill interpreting it. I feel like that probably has something to do with it as well. Um, would you say that most of the grain, so you did say that there was corn grown here on the island. And so was all of the corn, you know, at the mill was, was that from the island or was there imported corn as well? Do you know? Um, so I suspect most of it was corn grown here. There was about a hundred farms on the island um, in the 18th century. Um, Sometimes um, there is a alternative alter interpretation where where merchant ships are bringing corn to Nantucket to be ground, so they had something kind of going in both directions. Um, but I suspect most of it was locally grown corn. Yeah. Thanks. So, has anything else other than corn been ground at the mill, or is it just a corn mill? So I didn't talk about the the grooves in the millstones, but if you ever see a, like the millstone sitting right in front of the mill right now, you can see those grooves in it. And those grooves are cut depending on the kind of gra uh, grain you're grinding. Um, so you have a thinner or wider um, groove depending on the kind of grain you're, you're producing. So it could be used for another type of grinding, um, but um, I think that those grooves were intentionally put f for corn grinding purposes. Um, thanks. And that kind of answers another question that, that came in about whether the stone grinding surface was grooved. So, so since that it was, um, so cool. So, and I'm just looking through, were there any water mills on Nantucket? So there were tidal mills. So they use the tides um, to, to generate power. Um, I think that there was a small water mill very, very early on, um, but uh, it, there was never like a heavy, quote unquote, heavy industry water mill as far, as far as I know. And is the mill noisy? Like how loud is that on a windy day? Uh, if everything's running smoothly, it's actually not too loud at all. There's a kind of a gentle knock um, as the wood kind of meets its, uh, you know, the gears are meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if things are running smoothly, it's a it's a, actually a relatively quiet experience. Um, it's a nice sound. It sounds like a machine working the right way. Um, and I guess this is like a good time to mention too that if that the NHA does have a video right on our YouTube channel that shows the the mill in operation on a windy day. So if people ha aren't familiar with it or just kind of want to refresh themselves, that I definitely would recommend checking that out. Um, so thinking today, right, like you've mentioned that the soil isn't necessarily great for corn. We don't have like a major corn farm mid island. So where does the NHA get its corn now? So we source our, so we get um, human grade organic, even though we sell it as a souvenir product, um, just in case. Um, and we source it from various places. I think the last bunch of it came from Iowa. Um, so, you know, it, 
as a nonprofit, we need to, to be diligent with how we're, we're spending our money. But, um, but as, as best we can, we, we, we source um, human grade organic corn. Um, Cool, and so that kind of also feeds into this next question. So did the stones for the mill, did they come from the island? Um, and how long do those stones last? Well, those stones have been in the mill for ages now. Um, so those, those stones are, were quarried in Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, we think that they were the original millstones um, that were used in the, in the mill. Um, eventually they wear out and are replaced. But um, if you have a good, um, uh, uh, if you have a, 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 a good person who, who can cut those chisels, you can, you know, use a millstone year after year. And it all depends on where. So the way we're using the mill today um, won't require a replacement stone, especially since we're making a souvenir product um, for quite a while. But um, millstones obviously wear out. And so if you're up on Mill Hill, um, you'll see a few millstones lying about because um, they were just kind of chucked out of the mill when they, um, they wore down too much. Great. So um, this, you may have already talked about this, but is there any kind of break on the wind shaft so that if it's on a particularly windy day, you're able to, to reap the sheets? Break on the wind shaft. I feel like millers are asking these questions. Yeah, so. <laughs> there um, are definitely, there do seem to be a few millers here with us tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, a, there's another component of the third floor I didn't talk about. Um, so around the crown gear, there's a big braking system, kind of like a brake on your bike. And so if you aren't able to grind to a halt, you need to run up to the third floor and you need to, to let a big box of rocks down and that, that releases the brake and it grabs the crown gear. So yeah, if you can't use the stones to, to stop the momentum of the sweeps outside, then you use the, you use the, uh, the brake to stop the crown gear instead. Um, so this is also, I, I feel like this kind of is, is a related question, but it, when you, um, if the wind changes and you need to reorient the sails, like how would you do that? Um, yeah, so you just, you, you, turn the, you turn the cap. So um, during the course of any day, it probably won't change more than 20 or 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, so it won't, it's not a huge adjustment. Um, so today we use a truck to turn the, the, the cap, another simple machine. Um, we turn the cap um, with the tail pole and wheel attached to it. Um, and historically, like I mentioned, they used a capstan, a simple machine, or they used um, um, an oxen. Um, so a lot of technical questions here. I do, I really love this. So what is the, did you talk about the size and the approximate weight of those grinding stones? If people are very interested in knowing like all there is to know about them. <laughs> yeah, so I think they're 2,500 pounds. Um, and so making them fairly large. I don't have a good diameter number off the top of my head, um, but they're quite, they're quite big. Um, you know, maybe, I don't know, six, six feet across, seven feet across. Okay, yeah, that is And quite big. thick too, a couple, couple of feet thick, yeah. Yeah, and so what, what was the white lubricant that was being placed on the teeth of the gears? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we think historically they used whale oil to lubricate the mill. Um, today, we still try to use a organic product. So that's just vegetable, um, vegetable grease. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm just, we're getting kind of close to the end of our questions here. So I'm just scooting through. Are visitors allowed on the second floor when the mill is running? Yeah, so people aren't allowed to, to be on the third floor, but um, second floor is totally fine. Um, it's, it's, um, we have, you know, some safety stuff there. So if something was to go wrong, you'd be um, totally safe. And there's a kind of a narrow stairway. But yeah, the first and second floor are open to, to visitors in small numbers because when we're operating it, we don't want to be super crowded. Um, we want to keep everybody safe. And when a miller is having to think about too many things happening around them, they start to lose, you know, focus. So. Yeah, so one of the things um, I think is nice about the mill is that it's kind of like a, a two part experience, right? Like you can definitely park your car and like come on up to the mill and step inside and like get the tour. But it's also really nice because you can just be driving by and if it's a nice windy day and, and the mill is turning, you're, you're getting a, a kind of a connected experience with it as well. And so I'm just wondering, like, how do you know when, like, what's enough wind and like how, what's the determining factor for is the mill going to run today? Um. It's a good question. So is that your question, Amelia? So I, on a summer day, 
um, if the if the wind is if it's a clear summer day and the wind is between 10 and 25 miles per hour, I would come take a look because those are our parameters um, for operation. So clear summer day, nice steady wind, but not too crazy, not too too gusty. It needs to be somewhere in that nice kind of middle ground. Yeah, like if you if you're at the mill and you know how the mill works, you will know if it's the right amount of wind. Is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> not too not too hot, not too cold, just the right amount of wind. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, great. So these are all the questions that we have for tonight. So thank you so much, Carl. I, I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us, and I feel like it's a benefit to the organization that we have. You know, you and so many other knowledgeable people operating this this mill um, and I just want to thank our, our attendees tonight for spending a part of your evening with us as well um, media sponsorship for this evening's event is generously provided by Novation Media so please join us on February 16th that's our next NHA University and we're going to look at archaeological investigations at the Boston Higginbotham house with Dr. Nidra Lee and then on March 11th is going to be our next uh, historic property uh, webinar so we'll be looking at the old jail with Ann Martindale and I just want to say that programs such as this one are made possible thanks to the support of our members so if you are not a member do please consider joining by heading to nha.org membership and thank you so much and have a great night.